Have you ever felt like nothing is going right? I have. <laughs> Maybe you're in a bad place financially or your marriage is beginning to crumble or um, your business is not going well or you might even be in a place where you're not even sure what you believe anymore. You can go through those kind of storms and battles. You know, you could be a kind of person that you're doing your best to be an honorable person. You're doing your best to honor God. And yet you're going through all these things and you're thinking, well, why, why is all this happening? And, um, you know, it's possible for us just to be swept up in a tsunami of bad news and difficult things that we face. And, you know, it could be that a friend is diagnosed with a disease or um, the place where you work is laying people off and you wonder if you're next. Maybe you applied to a college and they turned you down or your car broke down, you need a new transmission or uh, you're a Laker fan. And so then you're like, yeah, nothing is going right. <laughs> and uh, you start to, it starts to impact you. And, and I want to tell you today that you can overcome life's battles. The message that I'm going to talk about today is about overcoming life's challenges, defeating giants in your life, and, and renewing our faith. Because battles have a way of making you feel like you don't have enough faith or your faith begins to dwindle. And um, so I want you to know that you can get through it. You can overcome. I want you to tell the person next to you, you can go through, get through it. You can overcome. Go ahead. An eagle, while in flight, can see its prey up to two miles away. Eagles can fly at a speed uh, cruising at 65 miles an hour. And they uh, can fly as high as 10,000 feet. So think about that, 10,000 feet, looking two miles away, you see the prey, and, and when they dive toward a prey, they can reach up to 200 miles an hour. And uh, we all know what that means in kilometers. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's fast. But I heard uh, a speaker talk about an eagle that was vulnerable to a particular kind of virus. And what resulted was that there was a little uh, wart-like uh, thing on its beak. And the eagle began to get sick. And he was getting weak. He um, began to lose his natural abilities that I was just describing. So the eagle would dive for prey and miss. Um, it would uh, begin to not be able to do, the feathers would come off and, and start to uh, uh, affect him. And, and actually the, the eagle would go into a, a deep discouragement that would turn into uh, kind of a depression. And the eagle would go into a cave and just sit there wondering, uh, you know, what's happening to him. And at a certain point, the eagle would... Uh, gather what's left of his strength and following instinct would fly straight up with the intent to destroy himself. And what happens is that he flies so high up in the atmosphere and as the pressure is changing, the wart bursts on his beak and he feels a sudden urge of strength. And over the next few days, all the, his skills and abilities, his balance and his accuracy, his strength begin to return. And when I heard that story, I thought of Isaiah chapter 40. And I want to read this to you. It says, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, and they will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. I love this because it describes a person who uh, doesn't have the strength that they once had. Maybe it's through weakness. Maybe it's through weariness. Maybe it's just through getting older. He said, you know, young kids have energy and young men have energy. But then he compares it to, but those who put hope in the Lord will find new strength. So he's saying, this is not even a natural strength. I know if you have kids, how many of you have like children under eight? Then you know that kids have a lot of energy. And I know because I've watched you that when they're playing and playing and going all out and jumping around and running, I can see you. You start going, yes. They're going to run out of energy and they're going to sleep all the way through the night. You're just, it's not even about how much fun they're having. You're just thinking, we're tapping out some of that energy. But he describes this, those who wait on the Lord. This says, the version I read to you says, hope in the Lord. Most versions use the word wait. But it's not a passive kind of wait. Wait on the Lord. Like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. He, I got to wait, so I'm going to sit back. It, this definition, as you look into the, to the Hebrew definitions of the word, it it's, talks about looking eagerly for. Waiting, looking eagerly for. The, the example I think of is, is think about the best waiter you ever had. And so he's waiting on you. And so when you move, he's there. When you need something, he's there. And that's the posture that we're reading about that we should have as we wait on the Lord. That it it's a, it's implies pursuit rather than retreat. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And so that's what we want to talk about today. And um, you might think, well, how do I put my hope in the Lord? And how, how do I find this renewed strength? So I'm going to talk to you about three ways to find strength for the battle. And the first one is focus on God's promises. It's about focusing your thoughts on God's thoughts. Focusing your thoughts on the promises he gives to you and I. Don't let fear run your emotions or your anxiety control your thinking because you can keep the problems you're facing from becoming overwhelming giants by putting your focus in the promises of God. God is his promise. If God did not keep his promise, he would not be God. It's just so important for us to grasp because if you think logically through the scripture, it's easy to look at this promise in Deuteronomy and you go, well, that's for the armies of Israel. That's for the people that are coming out of captivity. That's their promise. And then, then Isaiah, well, he's prophesying to those people. And David, well, he's, you know, that's when he lived. And then in the New Testament, well, that's for the early church and those for people in the book of Acts. And you can disqualify every promise if you want to. But this is the living word of God and he's expressing his love and his care uh, like a guarantee to you that he will be there to strengthen you. And we read, just read that scripture. He said that the weak become strong. Haven't you heard? He gives strength to the weary. So sometimes when we get weary and weak, we think we don't have enough faith to get strong. But look at what it says. God gives strength to the weary. If you're weary and weak, you're in a perfect place to find strength in God. You're not, it doesn't disqualify you. It includes you. And so when we look at the promises of God, we, you got to take them personally. The Bible is not a normal book. It's a spiritual book with spiritual truths and spiritual principles. And the Holy Spirit intentionally put those promises in there for you and I. And then, or you and me to be more accurate. Uh, <laughs> for 2 Peter 1.4 says this, God has given us great and precious promises 
These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. So God says, I'm going to provide something for the people that will get them connected with heaven's power. And God called it promises. He said, these are precious promises. If you're thinking, well, I don't know many of the promises. Well, you need to find out how precious they are and make sure you take them personally and have them in your head and in your heart because the promises produce power. And in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. So you're saying, is this promise for me? Jesus said, yes, I paid the way. I, I paid so that that promise could be yours. So in Christ, the promises of God are yes for you. And it says, and through Christ, our amen, which is a, a yes response to him, Look at it, it says, ascends to God for his glory. So when we, uh, God's promises say yes to us, and we say yes back, that's for me, that raises into the presence of God. He loves it that we accept and embrace those promises. God says, no weapon formed against you will succeed, and we say, yes, that's for me. He says, I'll give strength to the weary and, and increase the power of the weak. And we say, yes, I'll take that. That's for me. God says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. And we say, yes. We embrace those promises and it produces tremendous heavenly power in our life. In August of last year, 2014, I was diagnosed with lymphoma, a kind of cancer, and um, I began alternative medical treatments, which included a lot of green-looking liquids, fresh veggies. And um, then I, um, as many of the people here know, um, had some treatments of chemo that ended in um, uh, January. And with my immune system so low and you're vulnerable to things, so I got sicker <laughs> after the chemo. So um, I just got uh, different problems and issues. I, I got a bad case of shingles. And so for the last five weeks, I've been mostly in bed. And I'm not talking about honeymoon mostly in bed. I'm talking about sick mostly in bed which is not near as fun <laughs> as I recall. <laughs> Quicker, but fun. So um, much of the battle for me was in my mind and in my head because I didn't have the worst case of cancer by far, but when you hear that word for, for you, it changes your perspective you start wondering and asking questions and going up and down in in your emotions and um i i uh had to to do what i always tell you to do i hate that when that happens <laughs> and uh you know to trust god and to focus on the promises and and don't just sit there but, but believe him and um so it's easy when you're in these battles to get discouraged. You may not know anything about that, but I'm just telling you my story. Uh, you, might, you might have experienced it, but um, you know, you start thinking, is this ever gonna change? Or is it, am I always gonna have this pain? Or when am I gonna find strength? And, and so uh, you know, you're looking for ways to increase your strength. Holly said to me one day, you need to get up and walk about two blocks to find strength, and I was like, I got an idea. How about if I get up and walk to the front door and go back to bed? How does that sound? That's like a great start for me. You know? And so um, I had to focus on God's promises, the promises of healing and renewal and strength. People would send me a text message to encourage me or they'd make a comment on Instagram or Twitter saying that they're praying for me. Those, those are encouraging things. And um, you, you put your focus on that. And what I realize is 
let's be honest. Our problem is not usually that we're over-proclaiming God's promises. Usually our problem is we don't proclaim it at all. And the Bible's going, I got a secret for you. This is precious power. This is the promise of God. And um, so I had to focus on those promises and, and um, I had to speak words of faith and hope. You know, you can focus on your problems and they get bigger. And, um, you know, when I would go to the City of Hope Hospital in Dorothy where I was getting treatment, I would see other people with cancer and um, see them suffering much more or having greater burdens than me. And so I can, I can focus on, well, uh, I'm, I'm doing better than I was feeling or, you know, I, I'm not having to, uh, to recover so much as some of these people. And, and, um, but it's a continual battle. But um, I want to tell you about this study that was done in the 1990s by Dr. Masura Emoto. And he performed a series of experiments observing the physical effect of words, prayers, music, and environment on the crystalline structure of water. So he hired some photographers to take pictures of water after being exposed to different variables and then frozen. And so then they could form these crystalline structures. And then the result was incredible. And so I have a couple of photos to show you. And uh, these are blown up thousands of times, but on the right, you see, yes, you're right. Um, on the right, you see a crystalline um, cell where they would speak the words and write the words around it that would say hate and war and things like that. And on the left, these were what look, it looked like when they started to speak words of love and kindness. So they had this actual transformation of these crystalline particles. And then the next one, what do we got here? This one, uh, the one on the left, is water taken from a contaminated source, like a river that had a lot of contamination in it. And then this over here was what happened when they began to pray and declare blessings and continue with that attitude of peace and love, and it would transform it. And so I'm thinking um, that I think we're, our human beings are like 90% water or something. I don't know how that works, but okay. I, I'm, I skipped that class. But I'm just thinking the Bible's talking about death, death and life is in the power of the tongue. And we speak words of promise and words of life, and it can actually transform who we are. So... Uh, that's a great benefit to us. And so uh, at the end of um, the chemo treatments, they, they did scan and blood tests and they said they found no trace of cancer, which is great. <laughs> That's good news. And uh, then I'm, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm all done. I'm ready to go. And then like three days later, you know, I got all this other stuff going on. But a friend of mine said to me, so they did an x-ray of your head and they found nothing? <laughs> I was like, he goes, well, what about the cancer? I'm like, thank you very much. That's the kind of friends I have, you know, that try to encourage you with a little sarcasm. The second way to find strength in the battle is to encourage yourself. You know, if you think about it, we expect others to do that. But it's important that you realize that you can't leave your destiny up to everyone else. You can't leave your strength in, uh, in their hands. When they offer it and bring it, that's a great thing, but uh, you have to learn to encourage yourself. I have to learn to encourage myself. You know, the, the quest for faith may have left you kind of battered by the storms of crises. And um, having courage 
is something that you have the ability to do. We need to know how to encourage ourselves. There's a story in the scripture about David. And David had taken his army out to do battle. And when they returned, they found that another enemy had come in, destroyed a lot of their buildings, and they took their wives and children away. And they got back and they were devastated. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 30, it says this. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. It was like taken. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. So now David, his wife is gone, his children are gone, and now his, the people he's trusting, they're thinking about stoning him. This is your fault. And it says that David found strength in the Lord. He, found, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And it says that when his strength renewed and he, his, he had faith, then the very next thing he did was, so God, what do you want me to do? You can see in the scripture he is saying, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You see, I have special skills. You will find them and you will kill them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. He has strengthened himself. You know, discouragement will come right into your home and sit down on your sofa. Discouragement will sit next to you at the dining room table and whisper those things that feed fear and anxiety to you. Discouragement is no respecter of persons. Discouragement will visit you in your mansion and discouragement will visit you in your one room apartment with questionable air conditioning. <laughs> and we find ourselves hearing, see this is, you have no hope or maybe God isn't as powerful as you thought or maybe he doesn't love you like you thought he did. And, and so you have to find the strength to encourage yourself and rise above the discouragement that comes stro so strong against us. And the story that I just told you about David happened years after the, the famous story that most people know something about and that is the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was this champion soldier that was undefeated. He was 10 feet tall, we learn in the Bible. Well, David was a shepherd boy that was 17 years old. And so he found that the armies of Israel were afraid and this Goliath was shouting threats at them and accusing and, and taunting them. And so David because of his faith in God, decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut this guy up. So let me, let me read this with you, 1 Samuel 17. So Goliath's out there, and he goes, Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. And then David replies to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's army, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And then David goes on, today the Lord will conquer you and will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give your dead bodies of your men to the birds he knows how to talk some trash himself, right? I guess, I guess you learn that when you're shepherding or something. He's like, he's like uh, and everyone will know there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But not with a sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give it. Uh, and he will give you to us. You ever think about the battle you have is the Lord's battle? There are promises, there is his presence, there is his faithfulness, and, and he's there. And, and, you know, David was doing what, he was declaring the promises of God. He's bragging on God, he's encouraging himself. 
throwing out little trash talk, you know. And, and then as the story goes, he runs out and he has a little stone in a slingshot and he hits Goliath in the head and either knocks him down or knocks him out. And uh, so David runs up to him and takes this massive sword that it belongs to Goliath and judging by the trash talk that David had a little earlier, I'm guessing that maybe he knelt down and go, yes, you are a dog. <laughs> Who let the dogs out? <laughs> and he takes a, the sword and cuts his head off and then holds it up. And there was victory. And so... I wonder if you are facing something that looks like a giant, feels like a giant, it's, it's discouraging you, taunting you, and you think, I don't know if I am measure up to the intensity of this problem, but it's not about the sword and spears, it's about you are a child of God that have the promises from heaven, and God is with you to give you strength. Listen, there's enough things in life to discourage you. Don't discourage yourself. Don't help out discouragement by adding to it like, yeah, you know, it really sucks. And you're adding to this downward spiral. You know, you, you, it's interesting what people say. Sometimes you, people, you love them, they're in your life, but some people are good at encouraging and some are not. So sometimes you just got to fast certain people for a while. You know, and, and people mean well, but when somebody came up to me and goes, lymphoma, wow, I'm going to be praying for you because I know someone who died of that. <laughs> it's like, well, that's interesting, but I appreciate your prayer. <laughs> but I just want to tell you um, to put your trust in God, put your focus on his promises, encourage yourself, realize that God has done great things for you, and um, it's not over till God says it's over. Just because you have a bad season, or maybe you failed at something, maybe your dream has always been to have a business, and you've, you've managed to kill two of them. It doesn't mean it's over. You know what I learned just a couple of days ago, I never heard, that, you know, the famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis People just revere him greatly. And uh, he received 800 rejection letters from publishers, 800, before they accepted to do his first book. 800. I believe in trusting God and everything, but I don't know if I would have made it past 100 myself. <laughs> I'm not there yet. That's why he wrote those amazing books, I guess. After the first eight months, when we started Oasis Church in the 1980s, we started out with about 60 people on the first Sunday, and um, I thought we would grow from there, but actually half of them were just friends who went to other churches that wanted to encourage me. And so they didn't do a great job on week two because I had, we had 30 people. And with my incredible leadership, we grew in eight months down to 10 people. And that's counting the kids who they brought into the living room with them. You know. And trust me, I wanted to quit. I wanted to give it up. I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I must have missed God or I don't, I, you know, I, and I'm trying all the things that, that um, you know, that you're, you're supposed to do. And, and then... Uh, but, you know, we, we found strength. We got direction. We learned things that we needed to know, and, and uh, it began to grow. But I was thinking the other day, if I quit when I wanted to most, what about the thousands of people who've come to Jesus at Oasis because of our work together? Would they have had that opportunity? What about the thousands of orphans that you and I have impacted in Uganda and other countries that have, we've sponsored and given them food and clothing? Maybe they wouldn't have that right now. What about the quarter of a million people that generosity.org has provided fresh water wells that they don't have to drink contaminated water anymore? Maybe they would still be looking for it. And so you never know 
what God has in store for you. But there are mountains to climb and battles to face and giants to kill. Many times we have to fight for our legacy. You all, we all want something that will last beyond us that's going to impact our family and, and the community, the nations. And um, so the third way to find strength for the battle is to act on the great opportunities around you. And there's a good chance that if you're in the midst of all this, you don't even notice the opportunities around you. Because it's, you know, if David is standing out there and this giant has a sword and he's yelling at him and he's remembering his win-loss record, a thousand percent, that he didn't say, maybe I'll look around for other opportunities uh, because that would mean running away. But sometimes we just don't see it because we're so focused on our pain and our fear and our worry. And I remember uh, at the City of Hope one day, this woman who was uh, being treated because you could see her wristband and her, you know, the clothing she had on, but we're in this area waiting for blood tests and all that. And so she, was, she had this little basket and she was walking around handing things out, candies that she baked or cookies. And I just thought, wow, here's this lady who looks like she's having a harder time than me, but she's looking for opportunity. Here I am, so what can I do to help somebody? That's such a huge perspective changer. When we start shifting, even in the midst of difficulty, and we think, well, I'm too weak to help anybody. But God gives you the strength, and somehow in looking for others and saying, well, how can I pray for you, or how can I help you, you begin to find new strength, and your focus changes from looking at at your situation. And I say that to help you, but... um, in the midst of it, but it should be a way of living. That we don't think about opportunities as a way to get out of the problems, but it's a way to live, to serve others and help others, not just a week or two, but lifelong. You know, one thing I hear from people from Oasis many, many times is that when I put out this challenge, give Oasis Church a year, starting now for the next year, Till March 1 of next year and just get into it you know find a place to serve and uh, go to connect groups and come to church regularly really worship God and and at the end of that year if you don't feel stronger faith or you don't have more awareness of the presence of God or not more knowledgeable of the word or have uh, Christian friends that are, are a blessing to you then go find another church because I would you don't want to spend a, a year and just like nothing happens And so what I've heard from people is that that totally changed their experience on the journey because anybody can go to the gym for a month, but it takes several months. It takes regularity to see the true benefit. And the same is with church because in your faith, it gives you a chance to go through different seasons And you have some good seasons and some bad seasons. You don't depart on a bad season. That's when you need it most. And, uh, you know, you go through disappointments from friends who are Christians. And and so you get to find out what real kind of faith you have. And and so you navigate through these storms. And it, it builds your faith to be more authentic and genuine. And so we've seen that with many people's lives. But but I would just challenge you to consider that. And... Find a way to help others. You know, maybe you could help out with the children in the children's ministry in some way. Maybe you could mentor a young man or woman. Maybe you could be involved in some area that you could just help and serve others and help the church be stronger, more effective in what we do. Maybe you say, well, you know, I've, I've thought about it. I've wanted to for a while. I just haven't really made the decision. Well, do it now. Make a decision and start thinking about how to help others around you so it's something that you do whether things are good or bad. You're thinking of helping because that's one of the main commands of the Lord Jesus for us is to be a blessing to others and to, and to help them. And, um, you know, when, 
after David went through that situation where his, his family and all the soldiers' family were gone, it, he, the first thing he did is says, so now, Lord, what do you want me to do? Isn't that interesting? So I'm asking you to say the same thing. God, what, what would you want me to do? Because I want to be a blessing. I want to look for opportunity to touch someone's life. Love people. Good times and bad times. You know, there's a, a sermon that we speak and there's a sermon that we live. And the sermon that we live is the actions that honor God and touch people's soul. And that's the sermon we need to live. And here at Oasis, we have a passionate, huge vision for people here in our city. There are millions of people in LA Thousands of people who need Christ. Our whole vision is to reach people that are far from God and bring them to Christ and see them grow and into leaders, disciples of God. And, and so every service, people come. Either they come because they've been invited or they come because they've been invited so much they just hope that this time it'll, it'll make them shut up and not invite them anymore. And sometimes people come just because they have a need for God in their life. And so we have this great opportunity coming up in just a few weeks, uh, Easter Sunday. And I don't quite understand, but it's been consistent for 30 years, that people who are far from God or put no reliance on God during the year, for some reason decide on Easter, I'm going to go to church. Which is kind of funny to me because that's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. I mean, that's the big thing <laughs> right there. And so they, many people live as if it never happened, but on the day we celebrate, oh, I think I'll come. Which, hey, good, good idea, great. And so... Last year, we had services throughout the weekend. We had like 6,000 people or so that came, and many people received Christ. That's coming up. I invite you to, this is a great opportunity to say, Lord, could you use me? Maybe I can reach somebody. Maybe I can do something. And, and I just got to give you some information that I think will really help you. It's, it was, it's in a book where research was done by Dr. T Tom Rayner, and it's called The Unchurched Next Door. But here's the stats that he discovered by talking to unbelievers, people who don't go to church, people who do go to church, all this. And so here's what he found. 82% of unchurched people are likely to attend church if they're invited. 82%. Then he found only 2% of church members invite an unchurched person to church. You see the discrepancy there with the numbers? I'm not great at math, but that looks like a problem. 98% of church attenders never extend an invitation in a given year. Most people come to church because of a personal invitation. So when you ask all these people, you, you have gone, why did you go? The answer was somebody invited me. And the last one, he said, seven out of 10 people have never been invited to church in their whole lives. So I can see the need and I can see the opportunity and I can see the temptation to say, you know what, I'm really struggling right now. And I know you're, you're inviting to get involved, but I just don't know if I can do it. Yes, you can. You can get involved. I mean, this one, if there was an easy one, this would be it. All the people who want to come, if somebody would just invite, hey, I, do you... Do you want to be used by God enough to get rejected two or three times because then the acceptance ones are happening right after that. And we could help somebody. We could be a blessing to them. So as you navigate through the life battles, facing giants and so forth, I want to encourage you, focus on the promises of God because they're for you. I want to, I want to encourage you to encourage yourself Make sure that you strengthen yourself. And thirdly, look around. Look for opportunities to strengthen somebody else, to help somebody who's weak, even if you're weak, because you know a secret that those who are weak, God provides strength so you can be available and make a difference in somebody's life. 
I want to close this time in prayer right now, and I want to ask you to join me. Bow your heads, please. And, and God, I, I pray for the people here in this room. I pray for those watching online and that are going through these battles. And I pray, oh, Lord, that you would cause these three things to be clear in their mind and their heart and, and bring it to their remembrance as they go through the day. And, Lord, we thank you for providing such a great way to find strength in you. And while we're still in this prayer, I want to um, extend a prayer for those who maybe you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You may have gone to church, maybe not. Maybe you've read some scripture, maybe not. But what I'm asking is, have you ever, as an individual, said, today... I'm putting my faith in Christ. I'm, I'm putting my faith in Jesus, and I want him to be my Savior. That is a life-changing moment. It doesn't happen gradually. It happens in a moment when you declare it and you decide. And so I want to encourage you. Maybe today you're somebody who said, yeah, I would like to put my faith in Christ. So I want to just lead you in a prayer, and I want to invite you just to pray quietly in your heart as I pray. And I want you to pray something like this. Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I believe you're the son of God, and today I'm putting my faith in you. I turn from my sins, and I turn to you. And so I ask you to fill my heart with your spirit and your love and compassion and guide me in Jesus' name. If you said that prayer in your heart, we believe that you're born again, that you are a new creation in Christ, and we... Uh, uh, are, are um, so glad that you made that decision. But what I'd like to ask you to do is I wonder if you just let me know personally here. If, if you prayed that prayer quietly and you say, Philip, I prayed that prayer, but I, I really, really meant that. It wasn't just a, something I was going through. That prayer is something I took, took a hold of. Would you let me know that's you by just raising your hand up real high? Put your hand up real high all over the place. I see one here and two and three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, in the back over here. How about over here in this section? Just put your hand up real high so I can see it. Eight, nine. All right. Father, thank you for these that have made that decision. Bless their life and guide them by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Come on, Oasis. Give these people some encouragement for the best decision that they ever made.